So here you have Mr. Average, who's eating a processed food, modern diet. And because he is, his 6 to 3 ratio is very high, not enough polyphenols, so he has chronic inflammation, he has arthritis, coronary artery disease, he may have non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, he may have asthma or chronic bronchitis, he may have chronic obstructive lung disease. He's more likely to be depressed, he's more likely to have neurodegenerative disease. All of these are conditions where we know chronic inflammation is involved. But because he's eating a modern diet, he's also eating a diet that is low in these prebiotic fibers, which means he also has chronic inflammation in the intestines. And of course, this is what we see as practitioners. We see this too. So what should we do to such a subject? Well, we could shoot him full of pharmaceuticals, a strategy which is not going to cure anything, and may well send him into hospital, if not to an early grave, because we kill a lot of our patients with these so-called magic bullets, which are actually surprisingly toxic. Or we could get to the root of the problem and alleviate these nutritional abnormalities. We could give him a combination of omega-3s and fat-soluble polyphenols, which is what he needs. And that, in many cases, is enough to dampen down or even banish the chronic inflammation. And when we do that, what we find is that degenerative disease, the symptoms start to become less, and over time, the disease very often will go into remission. But we will also give this person prebiotic fibers, which restore the microbiome. And when you do that, what you find is that the inflammation in the colon, in the intestines, also start to fade away. And instead of being pathological, disease-causing, become physiological, that is a much lower level of inflammation, which you actually need to maintain in the intestines because that's part of the way in which you differentiate yourself from the outside world. Bit of science there. I'll go into it in detail later, anyone's interested afterwards. Uh, the prebiotics, I haven't really talked about them and I think I probably have to explain them. You've heard of dysbiosis, what is it? Well, our guts are full of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Not all positives are good, not all negatives are bad, but the difference between them is that the negatives are negative because they're coated with li polysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide, which is pro-inflammatory. So you don't want to have too many of them. Now these are the gram-positive bacteria, which are not pro-inflammatory, and if you eat prebiotic fibers, your microbiome has lots of these things, which is good, they're healthy, because they remain in the lumen of the gut, and they live in the outer layer of the mucus, but they don't come into contact with our colonocytes, the cells that line the colons. They're not invasive. And these bacteria are actually producing a metabolite called butyrate, which is anti-inflammatory. So this is a very healthy anti-inflammatory configuration. This is a healthy microbiome. Take those prebiotic fibers away. The gram-positive bacteria are starved. They're replaced by gram-negative. Now the butyrate, the anti-inflammatory, is gone. Now the gut is filling up with lipopolysaccharide, which is pro-inflammatory. And so now the conversation between the microbiome and your own cells is no longer healthy, it is destructive. Because these gram-negative microbes destroy the mucosal barrier, come into direct contact with the colonocytes. And unlike the gram-positive bacteria, which are saying, don't be inflamed, don't be cancerous, these gram-negative species are saying, be inflamed, be cancerous. Which is one reason why we have so many problems. Simplest thing to do is to put prebiotic fibers back into the diet where they always used to be, restore the microbiome, bring it back to gram-positive, go from pro-inflammatory back to anti-inflammatory. And you can do it with fibers like this. It's a carbohydrate but not one that you can digest. It passes intact through the small intestine. It doesn't get broken down to blood sugar. It goes into the colon, becomes food for the microbes. They break it down into short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, which is a very, very good thing. So this is a very short-chain fiber, and the microbes eat it from one end all the way to the other. And because it's such a short molecule, one gram of FOS will contain a lot of ends, a lot of short fibers. So the fermentation, which is how the microbes consume it, 
is very rapid. So we have to add it to longer fibers, including inulin, which is the same but longer. This is 1,3,1,4-beta-glucans from oats, longer, even slower. The resistant starch or resistant dectrins, larger molecules, even slower. And you need to have fast, medium, slow, and very slow fibers because in the gut, everything moves. So this blend passes through the small intestine and then gets into the large intestine, and it's <coughs> Fast fibers start the fermentation. They start the shift from gram-negative to gram-positive. And then the next fibers take over, the inulin, and then the 1,3,1,4-beta-glucans, and then the resistant starch. It's a timed-release system, like a relay race. And in this way, we change the microbiome throughout the entire large intestine. And when you do that, the inflammation goes away. Now, WHO says we should all be eating more fiber. And if you eat enough, it'll reduce the risk of 30 of premature death by 30%. Here's the breakdown. And they say you should eat 30 fibers. That's about adequate, but if you eat more, there's more protection. Problem is, our average intake is 15 fiber, grams of fiber, not nearly enough. They give you this advice, but it's useless. What you need are the prebiotic fibers. <coughs> the other fibers simply won't do the trick. It's the prebiotic fibers that treat the dysbiosis and make you feel good. So what are we eating? 15 grams of fiber a day, only a quarter of that is prebiotic. The WHO says eat double that, and what we've done is go one better. In our blended prebiotic, the dose is 12 grams. And we think that will give you the same advantages that the WHO have published, in fact, more, considerably more. And what we see is huge improvements in the condition of our patients and clients who decide to go down this route. There's two other major sources of chronic inflammation. One is deep abdominal adipose tissue. Apple shape, you know it's bad for you? Because it's that kind of fat that creates inflammation. It's invaded by macrophages. Bad news. So two things you can do, get thin, which is difficult, or stabilize it with some very special micronutrients, including carotenoids and xanthophils and lipophile polyphenols. Details don't matter, but all of those have been put into another formulation called Xenobio, called Extend, which also contains everything else that you need to alleviate and reverse type B malnutrition. One final problem, one final frontier, one more source of chronic inflammation. And it's not mobile phones, it's not stress, it's periodontal disease. Brush your teeth, spit into the sink, spot of blood, you have periodontal disease. You have chronic inflammation in the mouth, you have dysbiosis in the mouth. You're looking worried. Come and talk to me afterwards. If you have periodontal disease, it might seem trivial to you, but it's actually very serious. It increases the risk of Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's, and we think that inflammatory media, uh, mediators and bacterial metabolites are getting into the brain through the olfactory nerve. Because this is happening in the mouth, you're swallowing these compounds in the saliva, and that's why periodontal disease, we think, is associated with an increased risk of various cancers, including breast and prostate, resistant hypertension, and probably coronary artery disease. So we would like to do something about this, you can go to your dentist, have your teeth scraped, which is really a horrible thing to do. Or there may be a better way, a less painful way. And I've been looking for one for a long time. About five years ago, I found a series, a group of compounds in uh, microalgae, seaweeds. When you pick up seaweed out of the ocean, first thing you notice is it's slippery. It's very slippery. They're coated with non-stick compounds. And it turns out that those compounds, uh, fucoidans and funerans, uh, they're present in edible seaweeds. This is a seaweed that's eaten, it's baked into bread in Ireland. It's eaten in other parts of the world, including Scandinavia, Ascophyllum nodosum. Sounds like something out of Harry Potter, but it's a seaweed. And if you eat this seaweed, you absorb these compounds, they get into the blood, they get into the saliva, they bathe the roots of the teeth, with these non-stick compounds, and when you do that, the bacteria, the plaque, and the tartar simply fall off your teeth. And you can see that for yourself by measuring the plaque with plaque disclosure tablets, which you get from your dentist. And if you keep on using these products, two or three weeks later, 
the tartar drops off your teeth as well. And you can do this for yourself. You can also give it to your cats and dogs um, because it works in animals too. Exactly the same principle. And when you do that, the inflammation, the dysbiosis in the mouth disappears. And then the risk factors, we think, for brain disease and for other diseases in the body also go away. And this is going to be in the next version, the next generation of Extend, which I mentioned before. So this is the first attempt to generate a systematic approach to the problems of type B malnutrition and chronic inflammation. So it's three products, three delivery systems, because they're such different compounds. You can't put them into one delivery. It's not just not possible. So inflammation in the tissues, it's this combination of omega-3s and lipophile polyphenols. In the gut, the blended prebiotics. And in the deep fat, in the abdomen, and in periodontal disease, and for type B malnutrition, that is the answer to that. So it's very simple, surprisingly effective, and unlikely to subject your patient to the risk of harm, which is the Hippocratic Oath I signed up to when I went to medical school. First, do no harm. But anyone here who is a doctor or a medical professional, you know that we often do harm our patients. And we don't ever cure them unless they have a bacterial infection which is still not resistant to the antibiotics we use. We're beginning to move into the next generation, the next paradigm of healthcare. We're now starting to think of these things in terms of curative strategies and despite being highly effective strategies, strategies which are entirely safe. We think the pharmaceutical industry was interesting. We think that approach is largely wrong. We think that over the next few years, it will become progressively more redundant. And as it does, public health, your health, the health of your communities, the people you love, is going to improve. 